So good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to the Integrating HIV Innovative Practices webinar on replicating innovative HIV care strategies and the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. Today's webinar features two interventions focused on the unstably housed population. I'm Angel Johnson with the MyTech Corporation and I'll be managing and moderating this webinar series. Our agenda. Before we hear from our speakers, Shelly will give a brief overview about the SPINS IHIP project. Then I'm going to speak briefly about the CE credits being offered. Next, our presenters will talk about their interventions. And we like to hold off on responding to questions until both interventions have been presented. Then we'll do a Q&A. And then finally, I'll share some details on how to request CE credits and how to give your feedback on today's presentation. All right. Thank you, Angel. Hi, everyone. Again, I'm Shelly Kowalczyk with the MyTech Corporation, and I am the project director for the Integrating HIV Innovative Practices Project. Um, this is funded through the Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Special Projects of National Significance. We are led by Melinda Tinsley and Adan Kahina. Uh, in addition to MyTech, we uh, collaborate with uh, Impact Marketing Communications, their partner of ours on this project, which was funded this past September. And the purpose really is to support the coordination, dissemination, replication of innovative HIV care strategies in the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. So the SPINS framework, uh, integrating HIV innovative practices does fall within this last part of the SPINS framework, uh, as we are in fact developing implemented implementation tools and resources, uh, coordinating the delivery of technical assistance on these tools and resources, and then supporting the uptake and integration of these interventions uh, by Ryan White and other HIV providers. Also, this project is meant to align with HRSA's best practices compilation by supporting the development of tools and resources for interventions that are already included uh, as part of that compilation, but also by helping providers develop tools and resources that can then be submitted for potential inclusion in the compilation. There are some enhancements to the uh, Integrating Innovative Practices or IHIP project this year. Uh, the project does now feature not only SPINS interventions, but innovative models developed and implemented by uh, Ryan White grant recipients and subrecipients. Again, we are we do align with the best practices compilation. Um, so many of the interventions featured here can be found in the compilation. And in some instances, we're helping providers develop um, tools and resources and helping them prepare for potential submission to that compilation. We're also supporting the delivery of individual technical assistance on the featured interventions. So not just these webinars, but also uh, people can request uh, individual TA if you're interested in replicating a, the, an intervention that we're featuring. Um, we're also providing technical assistance on the uh, development and dissemination of your own tools and resources for interventions that you've developed and or implemented. And then lastly, we are offering continuing education credits this year. All right. And then just lastly, I want to go through some of the, uh, the key support that we are providing as part of this project. So we're developing implementation guides, uh, fact sheets, and in some cases, video spotlights on the interventions that we're featuring. And once these tools are approved and cleared by her, so they will be posted to the Target HIV website. So we'll be sure to share that information via lots of platforms versus e-newsletters, listservs, ATCs, the IHIP listserv. So we will make sure that you're aware of once the, the tools and resources associated with the interventions today, as well as those moving forward, that you'll be made aware of all of those. Um, the capacity building TA webinar, such as this one, to feature intervention implementers presenting, you know, their experiences and lessons learned on the interventions. And then the peer-to-peer -peer TA, as I said, there's an opportunity to request some assistance on um, the interventions being featured. We have the support to develop your own tools and resources, um, coordinating webinars on best practices and the latest strategies in creating implementation uh, manuals and other tools, as well as disseminating them. And then you can also request one-on-one -on -one TA. And all of that can be done by sending an email to ihiphelpdesk at myatech.com for information on the project, TA requests, more information on the interventions being featured. And that's all. Thank you very much, Angel. 
Thank you, Shelly. Um, so now I'm going to give a little bit of information on continuing education uh, credits. So we're excited to be offering continuing education units for our live webinar series. CE units are being jointly provided by the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, PIM, and the Myotech Corporation. Credits are being offered for physicians, nurses, physician, physician assistants, dentists, dietitians, health education specialists, social workers, and pharmacists. So as a little side note, um, we haven't yet gotten approval from CHES regarding the social work credit, for, um, and this is because the timeline for the materials to be approved took longer than we anticipated. So once Angel, we have- I'm sorry, it's for the health education specialist, not the oh. social I'm sorry, but the health education special. So once we have approval, we will send notification to um, the attendees looking for this credit um, and they can request it at that time. Thanks, Shelly. Please note that the opinions expressed during this presentation are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the views of the webinar sponsors and planners and information presented is not meant to serve as a guideline for patient management. Additional, additionally, our presenters have nothing to disclose and no conflicts of interest. So now it's time to meet our presenters. Our first presenter is Jamie Shank, a consultant for Organizational Empowerment, LLC, who will be presenting on behalf of KC Life 360. Jamie is an experienced public health professional with expertise in federal grant management, quality improvement, system thinking, HIV care, treatment, and housing-related service provision. She served five years as a quality and housing program manager for the Kansas City, Missouri Health Department, managing the HIV housing program portfolio, including multiple SPINS initiatives. In April 2020, Jamie relocated to Atlanta, Georgia, and launched Organizational Empowerment, LLC. She believes people working in the fields of public health and social services are the best people. Following Jamie, we will hear from Robert Arnold, Associate Director of HIV Services with the San Francisco Community Health Center, and Deborah, Dr. Deborah Bourne, Medical Director with the San Francisco Department of Health, San Francisco Community Health Center, who will be presenting on behalf of homeless HIV health outreach and mobile engagement, referred to as H Home. Robert and Deborah will also be joined by Martina Travis, a case manager with the San Francisco Community Health Center, who will offer a consumer perspective on the H Home intervention. Robert Arnold, who worked as a nurse for 12 years, he worked as a substance use, uh, substance use nurse manager at a methadone clinic for six years, where he established a system to help clients with poor medication adherence receive direct observed therapy every day without fear of their meds being stolen or lost because of being unstably housed. Robert credits Dr. Bourne with his coming to the San Francisco Community Health Center, where he has been working with the Getting to Zero and H Home programs for five years. For the last two years, Robert has been the Associate Director of H Home Services and oversees three separate HIV mobile care teams, including H Home. Dr. Deborah Bourne has worked in the homeless and HIV services for the last 29 years as a social worker, researcher, educator, administrator, and provider. Currently, she serves as the medical director for the San Francisco Department of Public Health Care Coordination Transition Division, principal investigator and provider for the Federal SPINS Grant H Home Mobile Integrated Primary Care for the Homeless, dual diagnosis and HIV patients. As both a social worker and a physician, she has worked with highly marginalized communities, including homeless persons, drug users, and incarcerated and recently re released individuals. Martina is excited for the opportunity to share her personal and professional journey. She is admittedly HIV positive and has been positive for 30 plus years. Martina was homeless for two years until in her own words, Deb and her crew rescued me from myself. She is a product of the H Home program she will be speaking about today and currently works as a medical case manager for the San Francisco Community Health Center. According to Martina, she is simply giving back to the community in which she lives and works. Jamie? Thanks, Angel, and thanks everybody for joining. I'm really excited uh, to be here with Dr. Bourne and Robert and Martina. So let's just dive in uh, while we have this time together. And I want to share a little bit about our SPINS funded project uh, we titled KC Life 360. Um, yeah, we have the disclaimer information. You got to um, hear my bio so we can skip through. Um, I do want to give a shout out 
uh, because none of this work would be possible if it weren't for the entire team at the Kansas City Health Department. So this is our KCHD team. Um, so this project was possible with Travis Barnhart, Debbie Adams, Joy Leitner, and uh, Mary Jo Hoyt. We can go to the next slide. And we have some polling questions to get this uh, webinar going with some interaction. And I think um, someone's going to post those soon and we'll ha I'll, I'll read them. Awesome. All right. So we see the first two questions here. So feel free to select a single choice answer. My organization offers housing support services. This helps us get a, a read for who's in the room. So yes, we provide robust housing services. Maybe it's yes, but we're somewhat limited. No, but we are exploring it, or maybe no, not at this time. The second uh, question, also single choice. Uh, we want to know how many folks um, are working with individuals who, who are experiencing difficulty finding or maintaining stable housing. Uh, yes, most of the folks I work with. Yes, some of the folks, not really, or no. And uh, while I see the questions, I don't quite see the percentage of respondents, but I will trust the other um, hosts or panelists operating it. Once, once you think we've gotten to a good uh, response rate, we can go to the next ones or post the results from these first two. All right, let's see how the crowd shakes out. So um, it looks like a, a majority of folks, let's see here, it's interesting. So offering housing support services. So fairly close between yeah and a limited capacity or no, not at this time. So good news, we've got some amazing programs and some funding source uh, tips and tricks to help bring those uh, to where you envision them. Um, we can go to the second question. Uh, in terms of working with folks, it's difficult uh, finding or maintaining stable housing. Because finding is one thing, maintaining is a whole other. And it looks like a huge majority uh, it has some of the individuals or some or most. Awesome. I'm going to close that. And then uh, I think we maybe have two more questions. Awesome. So now let's talk about employment because that earned income helps with that housing stability, right? So my organization offers employment and or job readiness services. Again, this could be yes, we provide robust employment or job readiness services. Could be yes, but we're somewhat limited. No, maybe this is something you want to explore, which is why you're on today, or no, not at this time. Second question, also single choice. Uh, let's talk about folks um, that wish to find work, but they cannot. Yes, most of the folks I wor work with uh, wish to find work but can't. Some of the individuals I work with, not really or no. Thank you for voting. So in terms of offering employment and or job readiness services, I am so glad you're on the call today because that's one of the that's one of the things KC Life 360 is going to specifically talk about. Um, so a majority of folks responded no, not at this time. But let's look at the need. We have kind of an interesting spread here uh, where some of the individuals I work with do want to find work, but for some reason or another, it seems that that's not possible. And then some folks, maybe maybe not the folks you work with, but who knows, maybe some folks you supervise or other members of the care team you're on would be representative of those who do. So we can go to the next slide. Thanks for sending your votes in. Um, and we will show how... Um, Featuring Kansas City, uh, Kansas City, it, we're talking about Kansas City, Missouri Health Department. Kansas City is an interesting uh, area because it's actually a bi-state jurisdiction. So this is just some context about a little bit about who the health department is and what they do. Special to this is they are the Ryan White Part A recipient and the HOPWA grantee in that area. You can sort of see in terms of how many folks are accessing Ryan White and or housing services, but the name of the game, and unlike many places I've seen in Kansas City, uh, outside of Kansas City is what a strongly coordinated system of care we are. And that's a huge key to the success. And you'll see that coordination of care reflected later on. What we're sharing with you today is part of a journey. So be kind and be compassionate towards yourself in realizing housing and or employment service goals, um, because this represents an intensive effort over the course of um, multiple spins projects and different work to get where we are. This is our philosophy in Kansas City. Uh, we operated under the belief that housing is a necessary structural intervention to end the epidemic. And this is what sort of held our vision and uh, our forward trajectory throughout. So KC Life 360, what is it? Uh, it, it was a SPENS funded grant, 
Uh, we love SPIN's dollars. We love that SPIN support. Folks like Adon, Chow, Corliss, Melinda, um, everyone there. And the intention of this was to address the intersectionality of living with HIV, experiencing some form of housing instability, and unemployment or underemployment, um, looking at the interrelated nature of all of those pieces. We partnered with Catholic Charities, who is uh, sort of an employment job readiness expert in the community there. And then we also partnered with Restart, who we had a longstanding uh, continuum of care, COC and or HOPWA funded housing relationship. Um, and we actually work with them. Uh, they secured a 22 unit uh, master lease building where half of that was for uh, Raya White uh, transitional housing and half of it was for HOPWA funded transitional housing. And some of these spends dollars also flowed in for the support services and other pieces. There was a multi-site research component to this project as there are with many spends. So what was our purpose? We wanted to be able to address the desire um, for folks in our community that were living with that wanted to increase their income or get different certifications, CNA, um, mechanic, different pieces like that, uh, large equipment operators. We wanted to uh, meet that need because folks are living longer, living um, fuller lives, happier lives. And, and we, we were really just sort of housing people, um, but not at, at the greatest quality way, to be honest. We were just sort of providing a place. So we wanted to address their desires to go to work. Uh, we wanted to bust the myths about how much people can work without losing benefits. Um, also through that relationship, that intersectionality, improve housing stability, um, and then also improve our key uh, health indicators like engagement, uh, retention and care, and viral load suppression. So how do we climb that mountain? Uh, we had sort of four main goals through KC Life 360. We wanted to vocationalize and address housing needs. What on earth do I mean by that? I mean, make it normal, make it um, a normal part of our portfolio, a normal part of our uh, housing conversation, regardless of your funding source, regardless of what agency you work at, regardless if you're a housing case manager or a Ryan White medical case manager. We wanted to make that uh, normal. So we embedded with um, dedicated staff, you see their second, um, the health department created a position through this SPINS grant called the Employment Support Specialist. We then sustained it by adjusting our uh, formula HOPWA grant to include support for that position. Um, so we had dedicated staff there, as well as partnering with Catholic Charities and Restart. And the SPINS grant supported some FTE as well within those partner agencies. Then we started baking in this assessment of clients at intake. Um, this had to do with what are your employment or workforce or continuing education goals, you know, going beyond like a psychosocial assessment that's pretty standard um, in our service delivery and asking about employment, asking about income, job history, what are your interests, what are your talents, and also what are your knowledge of benefits? Are you just not, um, are you... Uh, are you deterred from looking for work because you're afraid of losing benefits? And then finally, we also had that um, collaborative coordinated system of care reflected in our interagency collaboration, as I mentioned, and we'll go into more detail. So our intervention model, so these are the actual folks who um, help make that work happen. So if you're thinking about how do I staff this, how do I put a program like this into place, here's an example. Um, and, and some of this we built on over time because the SPINS program was, you know, three-year initiative. So we have a program manager, a data manager, house at the health department, representative of myself and Travis Barnhart, Debbie Adams, who you saw, she was the employment support specialist. Interestingly, she had been a medical case manager at a funded clinic for many years, a youth case manager, and then a, a family case manager. So, you know, she brought a lot of wonderful skills into this position. We also had a clinical evaluator that was Dr. Joey Leitner to do the IRB pieces and help with dissemination and publication of papers. Um, and, well, he was the evaluator, pardon me. Uh, Mary Jo Hoyt was, our, was a nurse and she was our clinical evaluator, again, to check in on those key health indicators and different um, screenings that we might find in EMR. At Restart, we had two partially supported housing case managers to work with clients when they entered transitional housing. What are your employment goals? What are your earned income goals? Is it job search? Is it resume building? Um, but what are you interested in and how do we make that happen as well as a program manager? And at Catholic Charities, a similar structure. We have the employment uh, specialist to do a lot of the one-on-one -on -one client level interaction, and then the program manager to also support the grant. So let's talk challenges and solutions at a very macro view, and we can play through these. So this was a new program. We had never done anything like this. 
we realized employment, earned income su- su- support was totally missing from our housing conversation. Huge gap. So we did extensive planning. We did planning around what does our database um, have in terms of how can someone make a referral, electronic referral? How can someone add case notes? Um, all of those little particular pieces. So we did multiple presentations to our entire system of housing providers and medical case managers. Um, we created an FAQ sheet. We created a program brief, um, and we kept that reoccurring so that new staff um, are onboarded appropriately, and then that refresher learning is uh, in place. Um, The next animation you'll see um, talks about that we needed employment expertise, especially that this was new. We needed to educate ourselves on um, benefits. We needed to educate ourselves on many of those pieces. So we secured that employment partner in our community that expertise came through Catholic Charities. Next animation. We also had a massive lack of short-term immediate housing, and this didn't come on until probably year two of the grant. So being a SPINS network, right? SPINS grants connect us with wonderful colleagues across the country. So there were two other sites um, in San Diego and in Atlanta that uh, used the SPINS grant to support emergency hotel, kind of a gap lodging. So we learned they were doing that with these dollars, and we said, how the heck do we do the same thing? And then um, they they shared their program resources, the administrative tracking, the how do you de-escalate a a situation at a hotel between client and um, hotel staff. And then we were able to um, get some approval for shifting our budget and use some carryover dollars. And then we piloted an emergency hotel gap lodging program through the SPINS initiative, which we were then able to sustain through formula, formula HOPWA dollars. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, as I mentioned, we needed our database to hang with us in terms of case notes, referral, uh, tracking employment, and again, recognizing this is a, a big want, need, and desire. We received so many referrals. It was almost like turning on a fire hose because so many folks were interested in this. So we needed our database to um, be compatible with that. So we did a lot of modifications there. And then obviously a ton of training. We wanted to focus on holistic care, um, and this was really successful through the co-location. Between our three partners, we had co-location MOU agreements between everybody. So the housing case manager could be at the health department at the same time, or the employment support specialist could be at the housing agency. So if an individual was there, because, you know, that's where they live you know, that's where they're at. They could still do warm handoffs. They could do care coordination, but we really solidified a lot with co-location MOU agreements. So challenges in depth. Uh, It took a lot of time for this program launch. I've never um, been a part of a team that dedicated so much to program planning, but it really uh, was a major secret to success. Even still, that's a lot of time and that's a lot of effort. Um, Client motivation, uh, which is, you know, a phrase we hear. So I, th- I think there's always a lot more into that. Um, but it's really discouraging, I think, to all humans to apply for jobs and apply for jobs and not get callbacks or to get interviews and not be selected. So rolling through that situation and those experiences is also something you need to anticipate. Um, I mentioned the insufficient stock of permanent safe, decent housing, which we were able to uh, mitigate with our um, emergency hotel. Cell phones. Baby boy, did that come up, right? So let's use our budgets wisely. Um, Folks need those cell phones. So purchasing phones, data plans, things like that became a necessity. Uh, And then we learned a lot through legal name change for new IDs for folks of trans experience, especially within the employment, um, you know, providing your ID. How do you present an interview versus how do you present on the job? Um, And sometimes client follow-up was a challenge, but I think we run into that fairly often. Uh, We see our facilitators here, again, the gap lodging, the employment partnerships, and coordinated system of care. Um, Here is information in detail if you are interested in adding this type of um, housing service to your portfolio. You see we've broken this down into steps one and steps two with a nod to the Family Health Centers of San Diego and Positive Impact in Atlanta. Here are more details, um, again, in terms of breaking into concrete steps, how you can add hotel lodging. Um, And then we were able to use the uh, HOPWA formula funds to add those line items. Here are our outcomes, and we're almost finished. Uh, We had nearly 94% of folks in this program achieve or maintain viral load suppression, which is huge. Um, 67% increasing their earned income um, through some form of employment. 
We also got 78 to receive permanent housing assistance and nearly 98 engaged in care. Um, and here we have at the very end, we have the, the voice from folks as well. So here we have one of our KC Life 360 clients. Um, she was awesome woman. And she says, I'm thankful for the support of the employment staff assisting me with finding out the process for the name change in another state. This is important for me to get done so that I feel better about myself. So this woman um, actually was hired multiple times. She relocated to Kansas City, Missouri, and she was able to get jobs and, and nail the interview. Challenges arise when um, she presented by the identity that she identifies as, which was sometimes different than in the interview session. Or once um, co-workers found out she was a woman of trans experience, that created some trouble. So she was getting jobs and losing jobs, getting jobs and losing jobs. And what a just awful experience. So um, once she identified like, hey, you know, I really do want to go through with the legal name change. Let's make that happen. So this is another woman and she says, we are stable, safe, and together. We are in a good spot. This was a single mother of three who moved from Texas to um, Missouri. She was fleeing domestic violence. So this woman was taking on that power and control dynamic we see in domestic intimate partner violent relationships. So for her, it was um, getting her and her three children together. She was able to get a job at the Casey's gas station that she loved in a more northern of, like suburb outside of um, the metro area. So she was able to get her kids in a school district that she was happy with. And um, there were just so many things for her kind of coming together in that holistic approach. Here we have uh, a gentleman who said, the peer educators and staff helped me and my family understand how to handle my HIV better. So this individual went through KC Life 360, um, so working with our employment support specialists at the health department, really, really care coordinating with the medical case managers and the housing folks. And um, he was more newly diagnosed uh, and he was really wanting to work through disclosure with his family who ended up being very supportive, but that was a, a huge deal. So as we were working on employment goals, we were also able to assist with this because the peer educators were actually a major source of referral into our program. And so there was a strong relationship um, with peer educators uh, across different sites in Kansas City. So how do we think about sustaining the gains when you want to look at the intersection of employment, earned income, and, uh, you know, living with different care markers? Well, we hear from one person, I'm just so thankful for the opportunity to be out of the winter weather and in a safe place. Um, hearing these client stories, I think it is the motivation to go through the challenges you go through or also just have the perseverance for how long sometimes things can take. The power of handing someone a key or the power of someone starting work um, is really, really meaningful. So uh, again, we found a way and, and it's, it's kind of bureaucratic, it's kind of tedious, but you can make changes to your Hopwell Formula Award. Lots of folks have had these for 30 years you know, or more, and they just kind of stay the same year after year after year. But you can do things like emergency hotel gap lodging. You can do things like support and employment support specialist through your Hopwell formula. It's just a matter of going through the, the steps in which to do that. But that's how we were able to sustain that position permanently and to sustain that type of housing service in our housing portfolio. Um, you also want to make sure your database stays with it. So we created an employment log because employment is very fluid. And so we really sort of needed the work history and, and all the pieces. Um, so made those adjustments, which is now permanently part of our data system. And again, continuing those relationships uh, with your key community partners. Here are our lessons learned and recommendations. Um, I think we've talked about many of these. Co-location is a powerful tool. Definitely budget for cell phones. That one was huge. Um, also think about exploring things like alternative transportation. You'll see on the resources slide that we uh, we we got bikes donated. And then ton of, a ton of clients got bikes, which is really fun and exciting. And it was like fun to have bikes at the health department. <laughs> you know, a little bit of levity and fun and work is also allowed. Um, and so individuals would maybe ride their bike to the bus stop rather than walk two miles to get on the bus to go to the job, right? Um, but being innovative is also something that SPINS is so supportive of. So explore alternative transportation and you can see the bike spotlight on the resources page toward the end. Um, as I mentioned, employment, there, there's some fluidity there. So keep that in mind. 
leverage your related care systems. Uh, we had to really work with our safety net hospital and other, our two largest providers to get access. We did HIPAA training, we did all this stuff so that we could see how our individuals in our program, you know, um, how is their health and not just um, care continuum indicators, but others. The other most important thing is that no matter what, any time in this program, while it looked at the intersection of housing and earned income and uh, care, housing was always the prime need. Uh, so that was something, you know, sometimes that takes longer than say the job piece, but that was 100% the prime need. Here we are um, toward the end. I wanna say thank you so much for my time and thank you for the support of, uh, of this group and the SPENS office and highlighting this innovative practice. If you click on these slides after they're sent out, it's direct links. Um, our site, Kansas City, as well as the other 11 funded sites through this project um, with support from Impact Marketing, who's on the call today, created a manual. So there's all kinds of details to supplement what I talked about. We have our one pagers when you just need like the short and sweet of stuff, tip sheets, um, the spotlight I mentioned in posters. This program, we did borrow a lot from HUD's getting to work. Um, and so we have that curriculum and training as a resource for you there as well. Um, so I want to say thanks. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bourne and you have my contact info there if you like. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jamie. I'm going to ask uh, Martina and Robert to hop on too. Um, that was a brilliant presentation. Um, I think it's going to be interesting and very um, to partner our SPINS program, um, which is actually all the steps for uh, a different population before the, the training uh, for when people get housed. And um, I can't highlight enough how important some of the things Jamie said, which is about uh, whole person um, care and looking at the whole person and their ability to um, have the life that they envision and dream of. And that's really where we came and started from with this SPINS grant. I cannot thank the folks at HRSA enough, Melinda, who is our, um, and all the people at in Boston who helped all of the programs uh, for uh, the SPINS grant. But really, this has been one of the most important impactful programs in the last 30 years that I've had the privilege of working with. HOME stands for, and sometimes we think it changes, Homeless HIV Health Outreach and Mobile Engagement. And really what we looked at is the system, um, it's a system, a program, and a client level intervention. And that's really uh, what we looked at. And our final conclusion was that the systems are the failures and not the humans that we're serving. So this is our grant and our disclaimer. Um, we love Wonder Woman. I hope Robert brought his mug. Um, we don't get to wear the breastplate in our meetings, but I would if I could. Uh, sometimes I envision her when I went out in the street, but really the first thing that we ha started with was um, looking at the system uh, and where we were blaming um, and looking at each other and getting that together so that the amazing human beings that were living with HIV, living on the street and using drugs and living with mental health challenges uh, didn't have to wrangle our confusing system. And many of your cities probably have similar challenges. So many different people came together in 2014 and we're constantly upping this list. This was the original group that came together and said, what are the gaps in our system? All the way from the hospital to jail to uh, nonprofit programs like a program called Project Homeless Connect. And I recommend you Google that and look to see if there's a Project Homeless Connect in your community. It's a volunteer program. Um, uh, SF Community Health Center and some other uh community programs. I do want to correct that I work for the Department of Public Health and not for the nonprofit. Uh, and right now I oversee health policy for people experiencing homelessness and vulnerable populations because this grant really helped us realize in San Francisco that we had to keep and look at this high level and have that be as organized as our on the ground programs. But really what we looked at is those times when you get phone calls, you're like, I can't believe that hospital. I can't believe that program. They did this and they did that. And we realized we weren't working together. We were blaming each other for the gaps in the system. So we got together and said, what can we do? What do we want to do? Um, and used a real collective impact model and can continue to meet during the time of the SPINS grant with these, um, with these groups. Uh, they're still meeting together in other iterations. One of the things Robin and I talked about uh, just yesterday is we need to get back to these basics of making sure that everyone is aligned. So this is a uh, first take home, get everyone together. The next take home that I hope uh, you can start today. And if you're saying to yourself, we don't have all of, we can't do a multi-agency multidisciplinary mobile team and leave our health centers. That's fine. 
we're hoping that in our t- next 20 minutes, you're going to take away some really key concepts. One is get everyone together, like Jamie said, who's there working with the folks and get them together. The next is, is that stigma really is the thing that's at tr- driving people not accessing care and not fully embracing their health goals. So making sure that we have programs that are not a one size fits all. And Martina is going to talk more about her experience and the different kinds of programs. She's now working in one of our programs now that's a low barrier social service program, but how different sizes meet different people at different times in their life. We want to also uh, have another visual for you to think about what our health centers look like. They're four wall health centers that people need to get to. And for someone living with so much stigmatizing um, uh, illnesses and many social determinants of health challenges, going to a four walls health center can feel like they're someone, uh, they're going to the Himalayas uh, with oxygen. So if you were someone who had a lung disease and you had a health center that was up here on the top of high mountains, high altitude, it wouldn't serve you. You could not fit there. But that's what the equivalent is of many of our four walls health centers. So in order to um, improve the lives of people living with HIV, in order to decrease the trauma to the staff that's serving them, we need to um, understand that four walls typical health centers are not the place and they just cause more and more trauma, which is called sanctuary trauma. It's a trauma someone experiences when they go to get and receive care and they just find failure. Even asking someone, are you ready to, I'd like to start you with HIV meds when they're not ready or able to do it is stigmatizing and can cause more trauma. So we really want to think about how do we make everything um, as accessible as possible to where someone's at. So When we all got together and what we still look at now is there's five areas that people uh, living with HIV who are experiencing homelessness or having uh, or unstably housed might need. The first is starting at the left. Everyone needs a safe place to live. And Jamie really highlighted the importance of that. What's not on here is um, is, uh, their own goals of support and work and life goals. Uh, The folks that we were working with, and Robert will talk a little more about this, really um, starting to work was not the first step. Um, It was really getting them somewhere safe. So that includes three different things. Anyone experiencing homelessness or marginally housed um, needs the first on the left. Most people with any health illness, just like in cancer, we know people need um, navigation. They need to know where the resources are. They need some social support. They need We need to understand their health literacy. These are two basics. Uh, What we found with home is that no matter what, even if we gave them all five of these interventions, people still need those first two. The next some folks might need case management, uh, behavioral health, and all the way to medical care um, that would be able to support them on the street. So we designed something called an acuity um, scale that we used in San Francisco, all these groups to say, not everyone is the same size. How do we actually systematically, and like just like you check viral load, and our CD4 count, we can get actual data to understand what the level of complexity is. Because sometimes someone comes and you think they need full on support and care, but they might just need med adherence. So we have broke everything down into these six different groups, med- medical care, physical care, um, uh, med- medication adherence, navigation, case management, substance use, mental health. I'm not gonna go into the details for time's sake, but all of this is available Um, to you uh, if you want to look at the security scale a little deeper. I'm going to show a couple slides of what it looked like. Um, It's not, was not completely animated. It's in a PDF. We've actually shared this with some jurisdictions who took this and actually made it part of their other systems. So we love when people steal what we have and use it for your jurisdictions, but it's pretty detailed. This is just the short version of a medical page. And so it helps the care coordination person know and use actual data, which programs, and we divide our programs into zero, one, two, and three. I'll go into detail about what those are to understand what they need for medical, housing, uh, what their functional needs, what their behavioral health needs, case management, and navigation. So we have programs that fit into each of these models. If you, your health center could do any of these, even starting with zero, our um, positive um, health program, Ward 86, Uh, through UCSF actually has developed a level zero program, zero to one program that's in the health center, but it's low barrier. People have open access, anyone experiencing homelessness, they've completely revamped their care to ensure that they're really serving folks in the four walls health center. Level one, 
Then level two, another program that Robert um, is working on. Level one is in a, uh, programs in social service agencies where actually I do my care, where Martina is the case manager. It's a social program where people go, they have lunch, um, they can pick up their meds, a breakfast, they can pick up their meds and um, do art, et cetera. Um, we have other low barrier options uh, for folks. Level two is um, half inside a health center, half outside. Uh, and what level three, which is home, we're going to talk about um, is uh, most of the service, 75% of the services are um, fully mobile. And we try at all points to get people as much as possible to um, a four walls um, pro program. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Robert, who's going to talk um, a little more. Oh, one, one thing, Robert, before we go, if, who's the gatekeeper of the program? Um, of who makes the decisions is going to be different in every location. But one of the things that the group has done is they, um, there are gatekeepers, which is a links program, uh, does our linkage through our disease investigation. And then we have another program at the hospital. Um, our, when they encounter someone living with HIV that's not in care, they go through this uh, assessment process and decide which program someone should be in. And then they place that person in that level of care in the referral. And at that level of organization is really critical. They also have a once a week Monday meeting where they go through complicated patients to try to decide which program that person should be in. Okay, Robert, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay, so home, uh, come as you are, wherever you are. Uh, perfect for the home model. Uh, it's, it's mostly mobile care to gain our clients' trust who do not trust our four walls clinics or have a lot of trauma from uh, hospital visiting hospitals and uh, you know outpatient clinics and such. Uh, meeting them where they're at is extremely important to gain that trust. You're there every day. Uh, they don't need something today. They might need something tomorrow. So um, home's target population. Uh, it's the highest level acuity from the scale that we showed before, um, considered the hardest to serve, and that's based on the clinic models that we have going right now. Um, they're not so hard to serve if you can meet them at their level. Um, so some of the qualifications to become a home client, um, you must have a detectable viral load, um, CD4 less than 200, AIDS status, um, active substance abuse, must be experiencing homeless, usually dual diagnosis, has severe mental illness or uh, behavioral health issues. Um, one of the key things that home does do is uh, the special populations, uh, working with HIV uh, positive pregnant women. Um, if uh, one of our positive home clients also has a partner uh, that does not positive and is negative, but still may still is uh, homeless or has uh, substance use, it's very important to bring them in because uh, one, you can offer them PrEP and you can prevent them from um, experiencing HIV. Also, it encourages uh, the other client to come in. Uh, they can, you're, they're working together for their, both their helps. Um, transitional age youth, uh, ages 18 to 25, uh, newly diagnosed uh, people with HIV um, and people that are imminent risk of ev eviction. So we help with eviction prevention or at least uh, getting them to who can help them with that. Uh, home couldn't have started or been possible without uh, coordination with other programs throughout the city. Um, street medicine um, is a safety net for the city. It is uh, it's drop in for an um, emergency. Uh, urgent care also for our homeless population here in SF. Um, and they provided the uh, medical provider, Dr. Bourne, et cetera, uh, nurse, um, medical supplies. We have a drop-in clinic with them once a week um, for them, uh, for our clients to be navigated to. Um, SF Homeless Outreach Team, which uh, they provide a dedicated housing case manager. They also uh, provide a clinical social worker and they um, give us access to stabilization rooms. Um, they help uh, guide the clients to um, being uh, housing ready, getting their ID, et cetera. Um, SF Community Health Center. Uh, so they provided the uh, the culture, the social work, the navigation, um, the program manager. Uh, we also have a um, open access drop-in clinic. We have a drop-in every morning from 
on 9 a.m. to 12, where home clients and other clients that are HIV positive can come and get breakfast, get coffee, uh, socialize, watch TV, check in with their case managers, kind of get used to being inside of the clinic. And um, our client intervention philosophy. So um, harm reduction, very important. Uh, come at it with love and care. Um, the interdisciplinary model, when we meet at home, uh, we have our case uh, management meetings, et cetera. We do not, um, everyone sitting at the table, the doctor, the social worker, the program manager, the case managers, the navigators, they're all sitting there with the client as the lead. So everyone is coming together with the client. There's no doctor over nurse. There's no uh, program manager over case management. You're all coming in for the betterment of that home client. And I feel like that's very important because it kind of lets uh, other like case managers and stuff feel more free to advocate for their client a bit more, uh, you know, staunchly. Um, so, uh, yes. Um, also remembering that stigma is the disease. So uh, letting the client lead you um, is very important. Uh, letting them know what, uh, like, where they want to be, if they're not ready for meds, if they are, do they need to take a break from meds? Um, and the, letting them know that these things are okay and help guiding them the proper way to do it. Client intervention, basic techniques, um, can quickly go through these. So uh, drop-in service programs, uh, mobile care is very important. So we have our open area where clients can come and drop in anytime they need something, but a majority of the time, the nurse is going in the field, doing phlebotomy in the field, case managers meeting, them wherever they may be, uh, um, getting them to all the appointments that they need to get to, or just checking in to make sure they're fine. I'm just going to go over some of the data high level from our study. We was published in American uh, Journal of Public Health um, and walk you through um, the data has changed since 2017. Um, but you'll see blue lines and orange lines. The blue lines were people that were in the study. The orange were the number of people in the three years that actually participated in home. And the, that difference in number, um, 40 clients were too psychotic at the time of meeting us to be able to be in the study. We couldn't do an interview with them within the first two weeks. We needed to spend the first month or two stay, help stabilizing um, them to be able to actually pr to, to be able to participate. They could consent, but they couldn't do a, a one or two hour interview. But just so that's why the numbers look different. Um, but it is important. We like to show that you start where the person is and you can still get to very similar outcomes, even if people are the ones that, you know, we had one client naked on the street and we used to go out there, they would be getting um, 50 and 50. They wanted to conserve that person. And they are now actually worked at San Francisco Community Health Center and started their own nonprofit. So, you know, this is the opportunity to just understand that the person presented in front of you um, is one of the take homes from this slide. Um, is not necessarily the person that's that is inside waiting to emerge. So the data that we looked at was the ability to achieve viral suppression, and the majority of people, seventy nine percent, were virally suppressed. Most of them before they were even in a four walls clinic. So that was because um, case managers, nurses, peer navigators were part of the adherence, and it wasn't just about the doctor uh, or the nurse uh, doing the work. Um, permanently housed, 83% of the people in the city and 62% were in um, side and signed a lease at some point. The, the numbers who have deceased are actually larger since 2017, and that's on uh, Robert's and mine to-do list to actually publish uh, what we know about um, five years later and where this cohort is. Um, discharge to standard care. We stepped people um, up to different levels of care. Um, so that they could go from a, a either a four or three program and they actually be going into a one or a zero program. Uh, and a small percentage of people were lost to follow up, which with this particular population is quite stunning. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Martina, if you can change the slide, to talk to us about some of the policies that even if you're not going to go out on the street doing things, there's, there's lots of things you could do tomorrow that had huge impact for her and a little bit about her story. Martina? Good afternoon. Um, I want to talk about the policies that improve the outcomes of the people experiencing homelessness. I did experience a um, short time being homeless, about two years. Um, I had no access to the clinics and I had no access to the case management and things like that that I deemed necessary in order to continue my life. 
Um, of course, they would bring pills to you, but already I was non non adherent to the medication. I've taken so much for such a long time that my numbers just would not go up. Um, the incentives that they provided for food, clothing, and gift cards, that's actually how I sustained my life for that two years. I really was out on the street and unable to make decisions that um, would help me to move forward. The housing support that I got was from the home team. The home team actually came and got me, picked me up from a um, couch surfing situation and tried to point me in the right direction. I think it, it wasn't just one or two people that came to visit me. Dr. Bourne came in groves with um, as many individuals that she did necessary for the different avenues that I had to travel in order to get my life straight. The uh, mobile teams that came out, that was Deb Bourne as well. And I'm um, doing labs in the field, coming out and trying to get me to motivate myself in order to go to these places and get the help that I needed. I, um, I communicate a lot with them and I communicate a lot with Robert here in the office. I was able to um, get things straightened out with my medication. Right now, we're still having a small problem and I don't mind sharing this, that the uh, medications that I'm on currently are not bringing my viral load all the way down to where it needs to be. It's hanging out around 20, 25. Um, and although that's still considered undetectable, I'm not comfortable with doing a few things that we do in life. I do have a partner. My partner is negative. My partner has been negative for eight years. And uh, that's not because of uh, using condoms and things of that nature. It is because of the medication finally getting to where it needs to be and um, protecting him as well. I am of trans experience and um, I actually would not come out on my own. You know, it, it took all of these guys to help me get to where I am today. I'm comfortable in my skin. I'm comfortable being of trans experience and um, all of these resources have brought me together starting out in just the standard hotel room. Sometimes I had to move from one hotel room to the other constant. It, it was like two weeks here, one week there. But the team, the home team made sure that I was inside. And being inside, I was able to uh, start to control things in my life myself without having other people tell me to do so. Um, I was hooked on. I was hooked on drugs out there. Uh, methamphetamines was my best friend. I didn't have any other friends, but I did have methamphetamines. So that would actually uh, sustain me for a short period of time. Now I've been clean for over nine years and without any methamphetamines, without any um, drugs to cover up what's going on with me. And I know that in any situation, I can come to the center here or I can access them. I can access Robert if I need anything to help me continue my life and my development here at work as well as the development in my home, um, which I can actually call a home now, you know, because all the people around me are there to make me feel at home. They're there to help me get through the hardships in life. I just um, have become creative with my own communication, using phones, not Facebook. I do not participate in any social media and um, the bracelets that are down here, Deb's going to have to tell you what those are because I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Martina. I do want to point out some things. Um, I, I think it's hysterical when you call me Dr. Bourne. We all go by our first names and that's part of what it is. We all show up as who we are, not our titles or not even our dead names. We're here as who we are and who we want to be authentically. And I do want to, if you don't mind me sharing, Bertina asked the other day, she's like, did you ever think I'd be a case manager? I was like, absolutely. I always saw, I just see you. And that's who we were always talking to. And you were the center of um, what your health goals are. Um, the home bracelets um, were the name The um, you saw one on the little puppy's neck. Uh, Robert's showing you one right now. They have the name of our program, the telephone number. And we've had people show up six months later and said, you told me I could stop in here. 
uh, when you met me on the street and here I am. So it's just a way that people can wear them and remind them. It was an idea of one of our patients who's passed um, said that if I could just remember that someone really cared and loved me um, when I was out there, it would be really great. So um, it was his idea and we hold it for him. So we're going to go, Robert, I'm just going to take this away. If you don't mind the challenges. Um, you, thank you. So um, I, there was a lot of challenges here and just for time, we're not going to go through everything. One is staying grounded. And uh, when there's a lot of trauma, either with a team, with a client, with a team or in the system, and that requires good communication and mindfulness. Um, the other is understanding that getting housed is a slow walk to the starting line. Uh, it's just the beginning. Um, and as Jamie's program pointed out, really having very rigorous programs for people's full lives um, once they're housed is really important. Um, holding on to QI principles also, and again, um, remaining focused in chaos. If we weren't meditating before, this is certainly uh, what we do now. And I'm actually teaching mindfulness for my department because it's been such an important thing. Some more challenges that we have is citywide. COVID was really, um, really challenging. I was actually pulled from the team and overseeing deputy for the COVID response in San Francisco. Um, the team um, really um, held a lot of people together uh, during that, but also political and other changes. Even there was four programs that started home. There's now three, there might get down to two what's going on, who has funding and being able to move uh, was really challenged, but very critical uh, in moving with the times. So I wanna talk a little bit about the spin-offs and our successes um, uh, because it's really important to understand that once you're starting to do this kind of work, it really has potential to snowball to really make some differences. And these are programs that are going on now in San Francisco because of our work. One of them is getting to zero. One of the programs that Robert oversees, it's a level two program that helps people. There's two agencies that are doing um, intensive case management, half in clinics and half outside. Um, there's a life skills program that we started to develop and getting back to uh, something called encampment health, which is a huge part of what San Francisco is doing now. And we got CDC foundation funding to expand that and some other funding from the CDC and something called opt in where we do low barrier prep SDI and other kinds of testing in encampments, um, and with, um, um, syringe exchanges. And I still work. Uh, two or three evenings a week at some of these programs. Uh, we have a pregnant woman mobile program um, that actually uh, works with women that um, use, drug, use drugs or experiencing um, uh, mental health challenges. And uh, we've had a congenital syphilis issue with a lot of women that are using um, drugs or experiencing homelessness. And this is uh, the home program has actually been the model that we've been using to help and support these women. The last program is something called social medicine. Uh, it's a social determinant of health consult service in our safety net hospital that now is funded with eight doctors. It used to just be me and another provider, a full a multidisciplinary team looks a lot like home where they support folks in the emergency room and help consult on social determinants of health. Um, really, um, huge successes. Um, and now there's actually a mobile palliative care program that is part of street medicine. Um, a lot looking a lot like what we did for people that are not just living with HIV. Um, we hope that you really take home for us is that um, you really encourage all of you to think about what you can do on a systems level, get together with all the programs that are working and just sit down and see what you can all share together. Um, coming together and incorporating any of the policies that Martina reviewed with you. But at the end of the day, everything needs to come from the consumer. The people we're serving have health goals. They might not be looking like the ones that we have to check off in our boxes in our electronic medical record. So understanding that their health goal might be taking a vitamin, their health goal might be that they want to come in and see you once a week, their health goal might not be taking a pill. You start from where they are. Trauma-informed leadership with great leaders like Robert, really understanding that we have we can work together in multidisciplinary teams, take the onus away from the doctors, and really have community health workers and peers rise to the forefront of the work, and then keeping the system aligned as we move forward. Um, lots of resources you can move forward that will be available to you that we use, healthcare for the homeless. We would love to help and support any organization that wants to learn and, and even all the way from any level two, three, and four type program. Uh, Robert actually oversees all three of those at his, um, at his center. And um, we just wish you the best and thank you for doing this work. Over to you, Angel. Thank you.
Deborah, and thank you, Robert, Martina, and Jamie for a wonderful presentation. So we're now gonna open the floor and take questions for our presenters. There were a few questions that were placed in the chat, um, the group chat earlier. Um, Eric wanted to know if, um, if there are articles about these programs, have, have they been published? And if so, if there's a list that they can get. Yes, we've, um, and publishing does take some some time. So I know we have some that are still under review uh, in a couple different op open journals from the KC Live 360 st side. Um, I want to double check the link to the manual. There might be some of the publications there. And then I'm also going to um, check before we get off. I might be able to share some additional links. Thank you, Jamie. Um, Deborah? I'm just getting... Um for our, the PubMed citation for each home that we did publish. And we did publish an American Journal of Public Health. I'll put that in the chat in a second from the entire spins with all the different, uh, I think there was eight um, programs that really did look at, some of them were just level zero, level one programs, level two looking at um, homelessness. Um, but ours was uh, with some of the more complicated. So I will put that in the chat as well, the link, but this is just a citation for our mobile program. And um, there's what you all put together, which is a great toolkit that people can take and use. Okay, thank you. And Eric also wanted, was, wanted to know, are clients present at the H-Home case conferences? Yeah, we can both answer from experience. Um, historically, no, <laughs> they aren't present. Um, they are advocated, represented by the case managers, um, but we do have a community like uh, community access boards where uh, clients from home and other programs meet once a month to uh, give feedback on things they'd like to see different at our agency or at the program they're a part of. And we usually try to make that, fold that into our policy. But um, generally they're not there unless we're having like an individual case conference um, where of course we want them to be a part of it. Yeah, Robert, I'm just going to jump in for one minute. One of the things that was really critical is actually to help support people at their points of uh, transition. So if someone was in the hospital, if someone was in a skilled nursing facility, if someone is in jail, um, if someone is was in we, hospice um, uh, programs, we would actually meet every time with the, with the client, speak with them first, make sure that we knew what their goals and would meet with the whole organization. Sometimes someone could be in three different places in one week, but that was a huge and important part. And so any care and conferencing that we had on someone's individual needs, the, the participant, the, the person that we were working with always was at those meetings. Um, just because of HIPAA, they weren't in the meetings when we were talking about other clients. Um, but if people had phones, there were times that we'd call them in and say, we want to do X, Y, and Z and have some questions. Um, because we used to give out phones is a huge part of what we did. Um, so conferencing with a person, um, having them be part of their treatment um, is, is really critical. And we don't, we didn't do it. We don't do it for the regular, for the home meetings. We're talking about everyone, but we did have participants be a part of their treatment plans wherever they were. And we would also do conferencing obviously on the street. Um, one of the things we didn't cover is that we go out always have two different disciplines at the very least. So mm -hmm. Martina said we had like a ton of people coming out, but we'd have a case manager and the provider and nurse and the navigator uh, in different forms. And if the other person that needed to be in the conversation wasn't there, we would call and just all talk and touch base. Okay, all five of us are in this communication right now. So we would have many little conferencing with the guest, with a person like in, when that person was, we visited them in their tent. Yes, thanks for clarification, that's right. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, Sharon asked, how do you fund and manage the distribution of incentives and other necessary items such as gift cards, clothing, and food? Um, I want to talk about contingency management first, which we kind of sk skipped over. So contingency management is one of the few interventions that's been shown to help improve uh, people's outcomes around methamphetamine. Um, that's when they come and then for a urine, I don't like to use the word clean because you're clean when you're in a shower, but if there's a urine that does not have drugs in it, they get a reimbursement. So we used contingency management to help decrease dopamine. Sometimes it looked like a gift card. Sometimes people wanted tiaras. Sometimes people just wanted food. It was their goals and we would bring it. Uh, Robert can talk about how they use incentives in of both the level zero, one, two, and three programs because it's, it's a great um, point to go up. Uh, yes, um, with home, it's important to be more uh, 
creative and allow the client to tell you what they really need or want and what it would take to get them where they want. But as far as the incentives of uh, gift cards, clothing, and food, um, well, the gift cards, our gift cards uh, for our programs come from uh, Department of Public Health, HHS, um, and we are allotted uh, so many per year. Um, and how we de- how we divide those out, the program managers work with the case managers to uh, use the incentives accordingly. Like some people need more incentives to do other things than others. So, um, but it's very important to track all of that. Um, clothing, food, uh, it's all just was in part of the grants that we've um, gotten since the Spence contract. Um, also to our agency just puts in for food and stuff like that. There's, um, I don't know how <laughs> else to do it. Yeah, uh, most of it comes from DPH. Uh, it's, it's very tightly tracked, but um, it's very important. They incentivize people to do labs, incentivize people to, you know, whatever it is their goal is, you know, if they have a client has a goal to reach, we can say, okay, I'll help you get there. And if you get there, is this, is this something that you'd like, or is there something else that would help motivate you to get there? Yeah, I would agree it's um, similar. So um, that really learning how to maximize your funds, um, it, you know, it really, uh, it humbled me quite a lot in the, in this four-year spend journey, whether it was my spend dollars or my HAPA dollars, what um, I was, you know, still sort of persistently unaware was eligible. So I think that's just something for everyone to always keep in mind. Um, but through spend dollars, uh, especially as it's related, like, we could get clothing, um, you know, hey, you're, we did a lot of stuff. Hey, you're going to start a construction job. We're going to get your boots. We're going to get your belt. We're going to get your tools, um, you know, really supporting a lot of different things. Kansas City gets a lot of snow and ice. We're a cold weather uh, place and we also get very hot. So uh, we ended up at the health department having a little closet for things like, um, you know, toothbrushes, socks, gloves, backpacks. Um but so some of this came through donation. We maximized Third and Long Foundation, which ties to the Kansas City Chiefs. So they donated food around Thanksgiving time. Uh, they donated stuff around um, winter holidays, like Christmas, Hanukkah, things like that. So maximizing some of the community partners who want, let's be honest, the tax write off for certain things, right? Um, just channeling that to to your organization. Um, but we were able to do a lot of clothing eligible through the employment um, like support line in our budget. Um, and then continue that through formula um, HAPWA as well. And what we did with gift cards is we also learned a little bit about client choice. You know, and like we we initially just started with one of the same thing, but then we would get a variety of stuff because some people wanted the gas card because they were living in their car to stay warm and they were driving themselves to work. So the gas card was more helpful. And then for other folks, it was food related. Um, was it a grocery store? Was it, um, you know, Subway or something else close by? So we also made sure when folks could receive a gift card, which was based on different appointments that they came in just to have conversations with their employees support specialists that they also had choice um, in terms of what they wanted for that um, that time frame again not one size uh, fits all and, and Jamie did you mention anything someone wanted to know about the cell phones and how they were paid for yeah again that was a line item that we were el- eligible to use within our, our spend dollars I have to think I mean I think we literally just budgeted it as cell phones so for some of this was a pre- some of some people we bought like a prepaid monthly phone for some people they had a phone but we helped them buy the plan we helped them with their minutes um you could also do things like hotspots something I, I did learn over time though is you know different folks prefer a phone to a tablet so also keeping in mind like the tech wants desires uh, and needs is something to explore but we started doing cell phones um right after year one because we learned that they were so central uh and that was eligible expense so our employment support uh partner catholic charities that was something you know they subcontracted with us as the health department so it was just a line item in their budget and the employment support specialist would go with somebody um, to get the prepaid phone and and or um, get a better uh, minutes plan and it was just a very straightforward line item, actually. Yeah, Jamie, we had a line item in our Spence Grant, too, for phones um, at the very beginning. And by the time Robert came on, which was after the Spence Grant was over, um, was not something that was budgeted, um, the rate that people lost it with this particular um, population. But the Obama phone and helping people get 
um, registered for the federally approved phones. Um, for Facebook, I work with the Homeless Youth Alliance and they actually use Facebook um, as their form of communication because the youth or other people can actually borrow other people's stuff to um, get on and it's a way of actually communicating. So we're looking at um, other more creative ways um, just for the consistency that it's not requiring it, a particular number, but it requires something that can stay um, that the person would have like the email or something. So, um, but it was a really wonderful thing to be able to have that with the spins dollars. And I look forward to when people understand about the equity needs uh, for communication and the correlation with health. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, can you all talk a bit more about options and um, communities when housing stock is low? It <clears throat> seems like most communities are struggling with housing in general. <laughs> Jamie, do you want to start that one? Yeah, I'll go first. So yes, uh, we feel that. Uh, one of the things that we did in Kansas City is we mapped out a housing continuum. We came up with what are the different sort of um, housing circumstances people find themselves in, and then what are the resources or what are the funds that we have or that are gaps so that we could begin to plug in those gaps. So we did some sort of strategic planning. Um, one big thing was, again, finding funding for the um, hotels. That uh, And housing is resource ex expen like um, resource intensive. It's very expensive um, to provide housing for even a small number of people. So, you know, that's also part of the challenge. But again, through formula HAPA dollars, uh, you can fund that. So we learned that lesson. We went back to our city's consolidated plan and we switched money in the budget. And yes, sometimes this takes money from other places, right? So you have to also navigate like, yeah, we're decreasing this, but maybe you've, you know, traditionally left some stuff unspent or this, that, and the other, but again, recognizing that collective need. Um, so fu formally funding it through HAPWA formula. Also, many housing authorities have what's called moving on. So with local continuum of cares, COCs, uh, a lot of different communities are doing an MOU, a moving on MOU agreement. So your local housing authority has a certain number of units that they need to keep filled in order to keep those number of units. So for folks who are on programs um, through your COC, through an ESG emergency solutions or through HOPWA or through something else, for folks who've been on a, a housing uh, voucher where their units pay for for like 10 years, eight years, 12 years, very successful, having conversations with your housing authority, doing an MOU to basically transition who's paying for that unit. You know, this person doesn't have, um, you know, what we would say is like high acuity, all those different pieces, they've self-managed, they've been there for a long, long time. Let's move them off of our grants and fulfill the need of the housing authority to keep units filled. The individual never has to move, right? So if they've established themselves in their neighborhood, or they've established themselves in their home, that's going to all stay the same. It's just sort of who's fitting the bill on the back end. And then that's going to free up housing stock under your current grant awards, so I would definitely look to explore uh, with your local housing authority and MOU. And in all honesty, the HIV services department and the um, Missouri department, like uh, a DMH, Department of Mental Health, we initiated that. And later on, the entire COC came on board, but it kind of created a channel for, again, folks who've been there for a long time to come off some projects, which then opens up, like it creates resources when you don't have to build new housing, right? Or you don't have to like wait for these big capital developments and stuff like that. So those are um, a couple of options. Um, also, you know, raise a little hell, uh, if you will, and support folks who are advocating. Uh, there's a group called KC Tenants. So doing a lot of grassroots organizing, really being present, presenting to your planning council, to your mayor, right? To put, put political pressure on them to make changes. Um, and really working with, um, in a city structure, your whole community development um, and your neighborhood division at your, uh, of your city departments is also someone you need to be present with, have conversations with, attend meetings with, build relationships with, uh, because that's where other housing stock options lie. Um, Jamie, I'm just going to jump in on some high level, um, because what happens is you have one social worker who gets and knows the system and can get people housed. That's why I would just encourage everyone. There is not enough housing in the United States for the number of people that are living on the street. That is the truth. And in your neighborhoods, if we don't get together in your communities and start to create coalitions where health systems are talking to the housing systems, we're not going to make any headway. And the other eight uh, nine, seven programs that worked on our SPINS grant 
some of the most lingering impactful work was coalitions. We only got $350,000 a year for this program. And we put money into community organizing because we knew that that was important for stabilization. I put in the chat um, information on what the HUD exchange and the COC is. If you don't know in your neighborhood, in your community, everyone, if you get HUD dollars, must have a continuum of care program. Go to those meetings, start to meet the folks and start to tap in. You have stuff that they want. They want healthcare mm-hmm. information and you, and so they want to work with you. So start to get relationships. National Healthcare for the Homeless, also wonderful, funded by HRSA. Um, As a technical assistance for healthcare providers working with people experiencing homelessness, there's a lot of programs in your, um, they offer TA, there's a lot of 101 to understand a lot of what Jamie was just talking about. So start to meet your partners. They want something from you, you want something for them. What Robert's program does um, now in San Francisco, because things have changed in the last seven years that we've been doing this program, they just make sure they partner with the person who has the ticket to the um, to getting people um, assessed for housing, and we're partnering constantly. The other thing that's really important is not just permanent housing, but for stabilization, because the reality is we often can't get people directly into care. So working with the folks that are running the shelters, if they still are using uh, any funding for stabilization rooms, for uh, money for hotels, et cetera. So we also have something in San Francisco called problem solving. It's part of the continuum of care. Um, and these issues are all they where they go and they have funding through HUD to be able to actually pay for, um, you know, you pay for little bits of dollars. So a lot of continuum of care funding is actually going for uh, funding that's not just for the housing, but it's for people that they need just like first and last month's rent. So really get a conversation with your continuum of care. These issues are so important from a health point of view that I'm no longer doing the direct work with home. I actually do health policy for people experiencing homelessness, meeting and making sure that we're aligned on the policy level, because this is just as critical. I don't, we don't that, that social worker in your program, that case manager program struggling to find housing needs us, all of us to get it together. And to say that to get to viral suppression, we need to understand that housing is health and we need to work together. So those would be my, right. You can do that tomorrow. That doesn't take funding is to start conversations and to start Jamie, when she say just alignment. Yes. Like a hundred percent. And I, every, you know, it's, we are all very, very, very busy, but building those relationships, being part of the committees or the groups with your COC and other groups really, really is important um, because we're also burning out uh, staff because you can't, you can't move the whole system as a party of one. And also it's not good for our systems to have those backdoor channels where you have the veteran person who's like, well, I know so-and-so at the shelter that's unequitable. And it's, it's, it's toxic to your entire system and it's harmful for the folks trying to navigate that system. Um, and, and it's hard to make a shift from that. We did that in Kansas, Kansas city, um, in the five years I was there, it, it takes time, but those relationships are invaluable and that policy, that advocacy, advocacy at that level is invaluable. Thank you. Um, Jamie, I have a, a, another question for you. How do you assist your transgender clients with navigating transphobia from housing and employment providers, including employers, landlords, hotel staff and management, Catholic charities, housing services, et cetera? <clears throat> Ooh, thank you, Amanda. Um, so a couple of things out is a big question. There's a lot, lots of pieces. A couple of things. One, one deal, and we hear this a lot with Catholic charities, um, was what's the perception of partnering with them and what's that vibe? And there's also trauma from folks' faith experience um, surrounding that. So before we even applied for this grant, we had a lot of like very frank conversations. How comfortable are you checking their internal biases and things like that? And they were actually very supportive, very open. Uh, so really just ensuring uh, that we have a safe partner to refer folks to and doing that vetting ourselves. Um, same with the hotel, where are we building a relationship uh, what part of town is this in? Um, very much explaining, like we we didn't die, you know, obviously we did not disclose status by any means. We didn't even disclose health condition. So we we learned from our partners in San Diego and PIHC, sort of how do you navigate like, hi, I'm paying for someone's room, right? Without there being a lot of unnecessary questions and nosiness. So we did a lot of partner vetting in terms of um, transphobia with employment. So actually, one of the things we focused on um, was for folks who were experiencing that, you know, obviously, if anyone wanted to make a grievance or a complaint, you know, what do they have the the right 
um, to do and what are the channels, whether it's a landlord or an employer, right? If they want to follow that process, um, most of them didn't opt to, to take that. Um, so we talk about, uh, you know, de-escalation also, and how do you advocate for yourself to your employer? You know, it's not okay for people, your coworkers to treat you X, Y, Z way. So folks would just not show up or just quit. Right. But so how do we navigate through that in a way that folks feel empowered? Um, and also how do we approach things like uh, the interview? How do you want to present an interview? How are you planning to present on the job? Um, are there things like your ID or other stuff that you feel like, well, I have to present, um, you know, my gender assigned at birth because that's what all my documentation say. Right. How do we think upstream before any of that stuff happens? Um, and then with housing, if especially if it's a landlord within our system, uh, especially being at the health department, just going to that agency and saying like, look, this is what happened. This is unacceptable. What's going to be the counting, co coaching, firing, termination or whatever of these individuals? Really checking people on what do you say your core values are and how are you showing up for them or how are you not? Um, but really, you know, being that direct with, with folks. So providing a lot of um, training as well to support folks who are uh, acknowledge that their comfort level is maybe low in these spaces, right? So it doesn't turn into discrimination. Um, but we work through our phobias, we work through our biases, the mental modes we carry based on our experiences or our interpretation of the world. How do we sort of crack that so that folks have an affirming environment? So those are some uh, examples. We we only had one person uh, with a landlord want to follow through with discrimination. So we supported them in, okay, how do you do that? What are the steps? Because obviously that goes outside of the health department's purview, but like, we'll go with you to that appointment. We will help you look through that paperwork. You know, what do you, what would you like to do? And we are here to support you because you're fully within your right. And then also we're going to find you a, a better, better place. Um, I hope that answers it enough. Thank you all very much. So we only have a few more minutes left to wrap it up. Um, I thank you all for the presentations and for responding to the questions. Um, if you have um, other questions for our presenters, we you can do that through the um, our IHIP help desk, and I'm going to give a little bit of that information. But be mindful that IHIP intervention guides will be out soon about these interventions and will also include links to additional resources from these programs. We will send out an update on the IHIP listserv once they are. For folks interested in receiving these alerts, they can subscribe on Target HI, on the Target HIV website under subscribe. You'll also note that there is a um, link on the screen for feedback about this presentation, and we would appreciate if you would provide your feedback. Also, when you uh, close out from this webinar, you'll get a thank you email. This link will also be provided um, in that email. Now, I want to talk a little bit before we go about how to request your continuing education credits. So when requesting CE credits, please go to www.cme university.com. You'll be prompted to log in or create a new account. Um, you will be prompted to either to enter a web ID or which is 17219 for this webinar, or you can look for it by the date. If you log in and you receive an email um, saying that your email has already been entered, you can click the forgot my username or password link, and that information will be provided for you. If you when you once you log in, if you already have information, please be sure to update your information. Um, so you will select the title when you see it for the webinar and choose the type of credit that you would like to receive. And once you complete the online evaluation, you will immediately receive a CE um, certificate to download or to print. When you go to the cmeuniversity.com um, website, this information will also be there as well. And if you have questions regarding the certification of this activity, please contact <clears throat> him via email at inquiries at PIMED.com. Also, um, to stay connected uh, for um, community capacity building TA questions, you can email the I have help desk at mytech.com. Uh, if you have additional questions for our presenters, you can do that. We will get those questions to them and, and, and get them back to you. And to access the IHIP tools and resources that was um, we talked about earlier, 
and to join the I Have Listserv, you can go to Target HIV website at targethiv.org forward slash I have. Any other comments or questions before we go? We're right at um, our time here at 2.30. Um, if there are any last minute comments from anyone, now it's time. We thank you all so much for your time, for your participation and for all the information. And we really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.